uh, additional tips for your remote hands on remote experience. Uh, also, I, I'm with risk management professionals. I'll introduce myself a little bit better shortly. I wanted to let you know we're using a GoToWebinar interface. Uh, the GoToWebinar interface has a lot of flexibility on your end to resize the windows, uh, to go ahead and, of course, adjust volume. Uh, you can go ahead and make the slides as big as you want. You can make the presenter as small as you want and make sure that it's adjusted to, to, uh, to your needs on your end. On this end, we've got a producer, James DeGraw, who can be communicated with via your chat window. Uh, if you're having problems later on, if you have questions, or if you want to go ahead and share some other tips later on in the presentation during the question and answer period, you can ask James, the producer, James, to go ahead and unmute you so that you can go ahead and share whatever tips that you want. Um, this is pretty straightforward, but if you do have any te uh, technical issues or concerns, uh, we do have somebody standing by that can answer that phone number on your screen, 949-282-0123. Uh, and they can go ahead and try to uh, help you resolve any technical issues or, or any other concerns that you might have. Um, as I mentioned, we will open it up for questions at the end. So uh, we're, going to we're going to try to provide as much detail as possible. But um, as appropriate, we'll go ahead and answer any questions. Uh, James, next. All right, so most of you know us as a PSM consultancy. And of course, we do a lot of process hazard analysis. I'm not going to review all this stuff. I just want to let you know that uh, the, the, the two presenters today, myself and Morgan McVeigh, are going to do the, our best to go ahead and share some tips, recent experiences, some things to some things that work well, some things to avoid when you're trying to orchestrate and implement a, um, a remote PHA. Uh, very important activity. It's, it's important to get it done right. There's a lot of tools at your disposal, and that's what we want to do is review the tools, review some of our experiences, things to look out for, things that, that, that can be uh, done very, very effectively with a remote, remote PHA. Uh, next. Uh, this is me, a little bit of background information. Uh, get a couple of degrees. Uh, get a couple of professional engineering certifications. Um, the numbers at the top are absolutely frightening. Uh, but so, so let's talk about Morgan. Next slide, please. Okay, Morgan's been with RMP for five years, uh, specializing in hazard analysis. Uh, she's got a lot of experience with has implementation of HAZOP and LOPA, and also compliance audits. Uh, she also has a couple of degrees, uh, chemical engineering, and also an MBA from the University of California in Irvine. She's also um, uh, co-authored papers, presented at the Global Congress on Process Safety, and she's got a lot of good PHA facilitation experiences, um, much, of what, much of which have been remote, that she, she'll be sharing with you. Next. So, um, we're going to run through some of the challenges, some of the key uh, preparation, planning tips, implementation tips associated with doing remote collaboration, remote PHA specifically, but a lot of this for, applies to remote collaboration activities in general. And all of you know with the pandemic going on, a lot of these, these necessities are, are um, not necessarily easy to implement, but if you're set up properly with proper planning, proper preparation, Implementations can be a snap and can be very rewarding in terms of protecting the health and safety of people at the plant site and also um, sometimes streamlining things to get the job done a little bit easier. We're also going to have a couple of demonstrations. Uh, Kayla Severo will be giving a general uh, Microsoft Teams demo uh, and also uh, Morgan's going to slip out from her presentation role and also give a little, uh, give a little demo on uh, application of whiteboard, uh, putting red lines on the PNIDs, things that you're going to want to be doing. Uh, during your remote PHA. And of course, we'll open it up for questions at the end. Next. So a uh, process hazard analysis is foundational for process safety management. Why is that? Of course, you want to understand your hazards so you can have some mechanism for controlling them. That's always been the case. It's still the case now, even with the current pandemic running around. And as we'll get into a little bit later, there are lots of reasons to do remote PHAs, even if there were some health issues for the team. In general, PHAs are necessary for whether during normal conditions, during pandemics, uh, the hazards to per potential hazards to personnel, the environment, or assets that are associated with your facility operation, they don't disappear just because uh, you've got COVID-19 running around. Uh, it's, it's the job that we're all doing with respect to process hazard analysis to maintain the health and safety of people at the plant site, the environment, and the public are important regardless of what else is going on with respect to health and safety. Uh, also, 
these things are important to be done. Even if some of the local regulators aren't as um, accessible, may not be at your plant site, or even if they tell you to relax a little bit, you don't have to worry about your PHA deadline, there may be other regulators, there may be other needs to do your PHAs. So this important job that you're doing still has to get done even in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, also, with the current economic impacts on facility operations, there may be changes at the plant site with respect to operation, with respect to uh, some, some design reconfigurations uh, to address a lot of the current um, economics that are going on in the, at least in the petroleum industry. And so this may require additional management of change activities that also need to be supported in many cases by process hazard analysis. So over the years, PHAs have become, become more complex. People are infusing LOPA, damage mechanism reviews, safeguard protection analysis, a lot of other things into PHAs. So they have become more complex, but quality has to be still be number one. I mean, you're dealing with people's health and safety uh, and environmental issues. PHAs have to be done, be done correctly, pandemic or no pandemic. And also, even during normal conditions, the application of some of these remote collaboration tools can help you get the do job done more effectively. So that's what we want to provide you, is the tools, the mechanism, and some of the experiences that will help you get the job done. Next. Uh, I have to warn you that uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the remote collaboration platforms, some of which you may be familiar with. Uh, right now it's April 24th. It's a little after 10 a.m. Pacific time. It wouldn't surprise me if by the end of the day there have been updates to the software packages. So we're, we're going to go ahead and these are all being updated constantly, new features, changes. I'll give you a snapshot of what we know right now. And of course, features and, and activities do change all the time. Next. So there are dozens of, dozens of tools, but there are a few that are kind of mainstream in the, in the business community. Uh, those are the ones we see most often when we work with different clients. As, as a PSM consultancy, we have to uh, morph into the, the platforms that are being used by our clients or by the folks who are, are doing the PHA, but they kind of fit into these, these um, general categories. There are other packages. My job is not to promote one versus the other. Um, but we'll go over a few, a few key characteristics. The one, the one undercurrent here is a lot of the features are common. And in fact, the features that you really need are common to all the platforms. They may be done a little differently, some may be a little bit better than others, but some of the, the key features are pretty common. So uh, regardless, and, and I know one of the packages has, has um, uh, I'll, I'll mention it because it, it is important, has seen some concerns recently from security, and that's Zoom. But in general, a lot of, all these tools are useful to be able to, um, to utilize during your remote PHA. So since the tools have a lot of the common features, let's, talk, let's focus on the features. The things that you want for your remote PHA, screen sharing, you've got to go ahead and communicate the information, both, uh, both from the uh, Scribe facilitator team, uh, also to other people that you may want to, that also may be sharing key process safety information being able to transfer those presentation rights back and forth, very critical. We'll actually be doing some of that for our demonstrations in a few minutes. Um, video, some people are very, uh, like to see video of the individuals. Uh, we put that in blue because it's not a feature that we've seen practically required for a lot of our PHAs. Uh, instant messaging is very helpful. File sharing can be very helpful on the fly. Uh, if the image isn't, isn't enough to provide information, being able to share files and get information to the other participants can be very, very helpful. Uh, whiteboard features, the ability to kind of graphically represent what, the, what you're discussing. Also very important, all these tools have uh, whiteboard features in one form or another. Uh, formulation of subgroups can be helpful to streamline getting people on board as part of the team. Uh, in blue is the default participant limit. There really aren't any practical limitations for any of these tools with respect to pulling a PHA team together. Um, having uh, the ability to pull in people who don't necessarily have a license for the software is, however, helpful. All of them have uh, the ability to do that, as long as the key people who are uh, formulating the meeting do have the proper licenses. Uh, being able to execute from the operating system or an internet browser, you're dealing with, when you've got a distributed workforce, uh, either, either during normal conditions when you're doing your remote PHA or now during the pandemic, different people have different bandwidths, they get different um, uh, hardware and software platforms, especially if they're working out of their homes. So the ability to either 
invoke these software packages from the operating system or an internet browser is super important. And also audio conferencing. Not everybody's hardware is conducive towards having a good group discussion. A lot of people like to use their phone systems. Uh, all these tools have the ability to provide a phone number and call in options. Uh, other things like being able, to being able to control somebody else's computer, recording meetings, have live captioning. Uh, those are nice features, but they're not they're blue because they're not they're not as needed uh, for um, for PHAs, at least in our experience. Th having those features is nice, but from a pragmatic perspective, you don't really invoke a lot of those when you're doing remote PHAs. Uh, the notes at the bottom, we've yeah, got a couple of uh, URLs if you need to get access to any of these tools and you don't already. The one thing that I did want to note for um, is the ability to have uh, dual communication channels. Uh, you'll actually see that demonstrated because right now, as I mentioned, we're using a GoToWebinar channel or, or GoToWebinar uh, platform for our, for our um, webinar that we're doing right now. Uh, GoToWebinar is, is basically in, in GoToMeeting or part, uh, from the same company. <laughs> so you'll see this in action. But all these platforms can be used operating independently on your computer. So you can have a single computer with dual, two screens, uh, one, running one, collaborate, one running one software, the other running the other communication software, so that on the other end, people with single computers and uh, two screens can also share in this information. Why is it helpful for our PHA? Well, in a lot of cases, especially remote applications, you want people to visually see on, a, on an engineering drawing what's being discussed to make sure the team's synchronized and talking about the same kind of hazards. So being able to have dual screen oper full dual screen operation where they see the engineering drawings or other process safety information, as well as the PHA notes, is super, super helpful. Um, so again, uh, setting up a dual channel communication platform, sometimes it can uh, involve a little bit of finesse. And I mentioned two tools here specifically that we use a lot, which is Teams and Skype <clears throat> as, as, uh, as examples. But most of these work pretty well with, with the other tools. And um, testing ahead of time, we'll talk about testing in a few minutes. Testing ahead of time is important, but it is achievable, and it's important for keeping people synchronized for the PHA. Uh, next, please, James. OK, also uh, file sharing, also really important. Not a whole lot to talk about here. Basically, you're just trying to get the information to other folks. Uh, Dropbox uh, and OneDrive are, are two key tools that we see being used out there a lot. There are others that are, that are a little bit more predominant in the non-business world. Also, a lot of large companies have their own internal file sharing protocol, whether it's VPN access to their various file servers or an emulate, a, a feature like Dropbox, but specific to that company. But these are two tools that are um, uh, business level. You can do a lot of things with respect to transfer, sharing information, making sure the permissives uh, provide the security that you need. And for, for PHAs, the, the, file, the file storage space requirements aren't that huge. There's usually plenty, even at the freebie level. And of course, at other levels, you can get all, the, all that you need for, with respect to size with various subscriptions. And I'm not going to go into any of that. Because even if I did, the subscription prices and features would probably change by the end of the day. Um, I put a couple of links down there. And number three note is very important. Even if there are security pr um, protocol in place and these are business level tools, the fact is that there's no security better than just getting rid of the information when you're done. So after the PHA or after people are done uh, sharing files, get rid of them. There's no, re there's no reason to keep information out there on the, in the internet that may be uh, proprietary or potentially sensitive to some companies. So just clean up after you're done, get rid of the files, and that's the best security measure that you can possibly take. Uh, next. So now we've identified how we implement hazard studies, how a lot of these things have changed over the years, and the availability of good tools that can be used practically right now. In fact, we were just having a discussion uh, right before the webinar, at what happened, at what would have been, things would have been like if this uh, pandemic or other neat uh, driving forces for remote PHAs had happened 10 years ago. You wouldn't have nearly the flexibility, the tools, or the ability to get things done, having a distributed workforce in people's homes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that uh, are available now 
that can really help us through uh, the current challenges. Next. Uh, so let's talk about some good and not so good applications. Um, for remote PHAs, and, and I do focus on HAZOP and LOPA because that's, those are the um, primary team approaches that, that you'd want to use these remote PHA collaboration tools for. Um, it's not just the pandemic that you need this for. Uh, things have been changing over the past couple of decades with respect to how industry uh, tackles large projects. Um, there's been more distribution of uh, design of certain subsystems to vendors and other specialists. There's been more companies that get involved to kind of spread out the risk associated with some large projects. So there's been a driving need for, uh, or there's been a benefit to doing re remote collaboration PHAs for a long time. And it's just been getting of in increasing um, need because of the way we do business. And of course, right now, there's a potential health impact with getting people together, especially if they have to travel. Um, these large projects, any project, timeliness is very important. Being able to get the job done, identifying hazards early. If design changes are needed, earlier the better. So whether you're in the middle of a pandemic where you've got to keep your team apart, or even under normal conditions, the faster you can get your PHA going, get the results you need, make the corrections that you want to do, the, the less of a financial impact it is. Uh, also, getting these remote collaboration tools allow you to get important resources together quicker, either earlier in the schedule or with a little bit greater ease. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Getting people together faster or easier means money in the pocket. Okay, so it streamlines projects, keeps you on schedule, and right now it means that you can accomplish things uh, during a pandemic, which you wouldn't be able to do without these kind of tools or approaches to it. Uh, also, you can have other people dial in that aren't necessarily key participants, and they don't feel like they got to jump in because they can just kind of feel like they're eavesdropping on the PHA, and they don't feel like they need to jump in or devote an entire day to go sit, sit in a conference room with you doing a PHA. And as I mentioned, significant travel cost reductions. If you're trying to get people together from different companies all over the world, uh, the, these remote collaboration techniques are super, super helpful. James, next. Okay, so we talked about large projects. Gosh, a lot of these speak, a lot of these improvements also work on short projects too. Uh, in fact, for short projects, if you're getting a team together and they have to travel, those travel costs and the travel time can be a significant fraction of the the uh, effort that you would put into a PHA for a short project. The ratio changes, so it's an even greater driving force for wanting to do remote collaboration. Also, if you're doing MOCs. A lot of these are very time sensitive. They may be needed right away to support plan operation. And um, uh, also, also very short, fairly short turnarounds. So really for all projects, these remote collaboration te uh, uh, techniques that have been available for some time and their implementation has been accelerated because of the current health challenges, this also energizes um, how people do business and utilizing a lot of these things to also provide ways to get the job done faster and more efficiently. And of course, more efficiently means uh, less expense. And next. So I put this figure together to kind of graphically illustrate some of the concepts we've been talking about. On the green end are uh, the, the, some of the key things that where remote PHA applications are, are very sensible. MOCs, large group activities, if you've got multiple locations that have to participate, fast-paced design projects. Again, sometimes you need that information and, and the results of the PHA very quickly. Short PHAs were that ratio of the, the travel and getting to where you'd want to uh, work together is a, it'd be a very a large portion of the total uh, PHA effort. Getting subject matter experts together quickly, efficiently to get something resolved so you don't have as many follow-up items, we'll talk about that in a second, super, super helpful. Um, and also some of these uh, approaches have, have been used for a while just maybe not quite as much. It's more common when you're doing a co-located PHA to see people with their laptops and querying uh, to, uh, other people at the plant site or whatever to get some additional information. Um, some, there are occasions where co-location is, is better. It may be cost effective in a lot of cases. Sometimes you need face-to-face -face contact. It also depends on who's on the team to, to, to really tell you if you can do, do remote PHAs practically. Um, operating facilities and units, or again, where it's practical, 
are good good uh, things, good reasons to do a co-located PHA. Uh, things have changed a lot. The workforce has changed. You take your, your average person on the team 10, 15 years ago and immediately catapult them into the, a remote PHA environment with uh, screen sharing and uh, audio on the conference call and looking at P90s on the screen. Uh, it's a transition. It's a paradigm shift in terms of how people do work. Well, over the past few years, people have become more accustomed to that, more accustomed to being able to work in a focused manner at their home, work, work with looking at a computer screen, et cetera. Even right now, as I'm doing this presentation, usually um, you roll the clock back a couple of decades, you have a room full of people, you make eye contact, whatever. Now I'm staring into a camera. These are all changes in how we do business. And right now, with the way the workforce has changed, the ability to do remote PHAs effectively has become very much a uh, state of the practice, I, I guess I'd like to say. The one thing that um, I do want to make a note of is the, the statement at the bottom of the screen. In the past, and this goes back to what I was talking about, the shift of, of workplace practices. In the past, you would, you would truthfully say that you'd lose some efficiency. When I put together a paper in 2018 on using remote PHAs, and we presented at the Global Congress on Process Safety, in the paper, and some, a lot of you probably have a copy of that, I said, maybe about 80% is efficient, factor that into your timing. But realistically, things have changed already. People are more accustomed to remote collaboration, number one. Um, there's, there's a greater ability to, for people to jump in there and work with their equipment in their own location and actually engage in the team. Uh, also, facilitators, and we'll talk more about uh, facilitator skills, or at least Morgan will in a few minutes. Facilitators have become more accustomed to reaching out and getting people's attention remotely, whereas if they were, if you're co-located, it was a little easier, eye contact, walk over, get their attention, uh, whatever. Um, it's a, that part can be a little more challenging remotely. So I've used efficiencies less than 100% before, but there are some advantages to remote location. You can quickly engage subject matter experts, get people um, involved in the team, or have them on standby, and they're able to be on standby because they can jump in easily. So efficient, that part of the efficiency has actually increased quite a bit. So there's a balance there. And so that's what I'm saying right now. It's typically your remote PHA is as effective as an in-person session. Of course, there's, there's trade-offs, there's pros and cons, and it depends on people, like anything else in this world. And so you've got to gauge your ability to team how they and their work practices. Okay, next. Um, so there, there are some, uh, as I mentioned, better access to part-time members to resolve issues quickly, rather than putting them on a parking lot and have somebody follow up and get back to you. Uh, you've got uh, ability to grab outside engineers, somebody else to provide opinions, information, operations staff that can look things up and actually explain it to the team, not just send an email in a day or two but actually log in, explain it to the team, join right in, and everybody hears the same thing and has the ability to interact with operations or engineers. Also subject matter experts, that ability to interact rather than just one-way communications can be another benefit or spin-off benefit of remote PHAs. Uh, being able to align the team with a whiteboard feature, yeah, we all, we all did in-person PHAs with a whiteboard on the, on the wall, uh, in the distant past, it used to be a chalkboard, but at least a whiteboard and, and maybe a large screen in the middle and the ability, even um, right now, a lot of uh, ability to transfer the rights to being able to present something on the screen in a conference room. Those have all become easier and easier and easier. Right now, all these whiteboard features are built right into the software, and actually Morgan's going to be doing a demonstration on one of those. Um, be able to a screen share, everybody's getting practiced with using these tools so they can screen share when they got important process safety information. And also management. Management can just dial in. Now, are they going to dial in all the time? Heck no. They've got lots of other things to do. But because they can easily join in your team or supervise or whatever, they're more comfortable with the fact that you're going to do a good job. And in fact, for some people on, on your team, they may do a better job if they feel that management can dial, dial in at any time too. So I'm going to call Morgan up in the next slide, please, James. And I'm going to go ahead and yak for a second and call Morgan up. So really, after you've identified that, that telecollaboration is, okay, you, you're able to do this, and it's a good thing to do, and your team can accommodate it properly, 
planning and preparation, you know, planning, getting the right people on the team, preparation with equipment and also the technical preparation as well as uh, implementation are super, super important. And I'm going to go turn it over to Morgan to talk a little bit about that before I come up and introduce some of the demonstrations. Can you sit outside? Thank you. And it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Steve, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, so as Steve said, my name is Morgan McVeigh. Um, and I'm going to be going through a couple more slides. So for planning preparation tips for the remote hat off program. Um, so first off, I'm going to go over some additional important skill sets that needs amplification by the facilitator. Um, obviously, the facilitator is the person in charge and meeting and make sure that everything goes smoothly. And so having a remote PHA setup uh, creates a couple more um, skills that they need to work on. And so the first one would be technical acuity, team engagement, more background on team member responsibilities, judging and facilitating input. Um, so at the end of the day, the facilitator is the one asking all the questions. And so it's really helpful if the facilitator knows their team. Um, and with and by that, I mean, if you know all the team members' names and you can ask questions specifically to those uh, personnel, it facilitates a response, which is really helpful when you're in a remote uh, team setting. And also knowing the backgrounds of each individual and knowing which questions to be directed to which person is very helpful for a remote PHA. Um, there's also the importance of familiarity with telecollaboration software for both the facilitator and the scribe. And then as always, practicing before session time is extremely important. Um, and so for the scribe, they also have additional uh, responsibilities with the remote PHA. So a quality scribe support is essential for remote Hazoff Lopa. Um, so the, they need to have familiarity with Hazoff Lopa techniques and software. If you're using PHA Pro or PHA Works, it, it's much more helpful when they know how to work with that software and they can keep up with everything. Also familiarity with reading engineering drawings. As you're going through, uh, it's very helpful when the scribe can look at a engineering drawing and identify a tag number and a pin ID number and put all that information within each scenario and that allows the facilitator more time to focus on team discussions. Uh, also familiarity with telecollaboration software, uh, robust understanding of the communications environment. Scribe support cost balance, uh, as always, it is much, much, much more helpful to have a scribe as part of the team. It helps make things a bit more streamlined and allows the facilitator to focus on uh, the team discussions, what's being said, help lead the team towards uh, conclusions and coming to an answer and figuring out what additional resources needs to be uh, obtained. And having a scribe uh, be able to help out with that is, is very imperative. Uh, Co-location of facilitator and scribe is optimal, but not uh, but it is optional. At the end of the day, it is possible to do a PHA and have a facilitator and scribe in different rooms. Um, and then for the process engineer, they've got some additional responsibilities as well. They want to separate the PFD and the PNID display. It's very helpful to have two different monitors to be working with that allows uh, the process engineer to follow along with the facilitator with which showing the PNIDs and the PHA Pro software, and then also be able to look up PSI information on another display. So multiple screen capabilities via parallel communication channels. Also noted PFD, PNID grid format is very helpful for when discussing um, different equipment locations on PNIDs. That's uh, a helpful reference tool. And then PNID augmentation. Also it's imperative that for a remote PHA that they have access to whatever PSI information will be necessary for that study. So they need to have the ability to quickly locate for example, relief valve, design basis, mechanical uh, integrity information, piping specifications, pump characteristics, uh, and then any information that they are able to download in advance, uh, that would be very helpful if there's a VPN connection, just to have a backup for that. Um, and then they should also practice screen sharing as well. And it is very nice when the engineer can take over the screen and show the rest of the team uh, what they're looking at and how they're coming to whatever conclusion they are. And so that's definitely facilitated with having the remote 
BHA considerations. So EP. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about the physical access and room configuration. So verify room configuration and location with consideration to the following. Uh, background noise, space, and distractions. So wherever you're going to set up for your remote PHA, each team member, you want to take into consideration. Um, your location and kind of your surroundings, you want to make sure that there are as, as limited distractions as possible and that you have enough space for both your monitors and for your PIEs so you can follow along. Um, and then it, eliminating distractions helps you focus as well and make sure uh, streamlined participation in PHA. And then uh, check power and communication connections for all computer equipment. You want to verify sufficient communications bandwidth and verify that equipment is contemporary and compatible. So at the end of the day, you just want to ensure that you have all access or you have access to all the necessary information that might be needed as part of the PHA. Equipment. You want to make sure that your equipment is adequate, reliable, compatible. Uh, you want to make sure that the computers are compatible, the displays, everything with respect to audio, software. Uh, you want to work through it all beforehand before you start the remote PHA. Uh, cameras are optional. Um, as Steve talked about a little bit before, it kind of depends, and I'll talk about it a little bit as well. And then pre-arrangement of communications access and IT support. Perform operating system updates in advance for latest drivers and to avoid interruptions. And also I wanted to mention that you want to test your microphone audio prior to session. Um, as experience has indicated, that computer microphone might be better uh, than using a call-in speakerphone uh, microphone. Sometimes we've experienced that has, might have a lower quality. And then also we recommend consistency between team members is preferable. Um, due to potential volume differences between microphone and speakerphone usage when calling in, if you have an operator uh, just using his microphone on his computer, but you have a, the engineer call in on, and do a speakerphone, sometimes the volume differences is a little uh, so something to take into consideration. Uh, so yeah, for equipment, you just want to test, 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 and make sure that all is streamlined and ready to go before you start the session. Um, technical preparation. So as you go through, you want to make sure that you have predefined uh, causes and that you can communicate those causes efficiently and effectively to the team during the PHA. Uh, so this includes completeness, team readiness, uh, future use. you got to remember when you're going through and doing a hazard that your document at the end of the day is usable by outsiders and will still be usable in even five years. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have causes identified with PNIDs, hopefully, and you can clearly identify what uh, your initiating event is and then delineate the consequences associated with it and just make sure that the documentation is usable at the end of the day. Um, so that's not any different. Uh, and then ability to quickly locate equipment on PNIDs during session. This is extremely important, especially with remote PHAs. Um, so for that, it's helpful to have a combined PNID set for easy reference. I do suggest having a notepad and writing down key PDF pages associated with specific PNIDs. And this just allows you to easily jump between them as you're going through. If you have a set of uh, 30 PNIDs, if you can remember that PNID 109 is on PDF page 3, then you can just put in the 3 and jump between them, which is really helpful. Uh, if you can memorize it, that's great. I use a notepad. Um, it also might be helpful, depending on how many PNIDs that you have for your study, um, to have separate PNIDs also saved uh, with the PNID number on it, and that way you can easily reference it and open it uh, and locate the one that you're looking for. Uh, be careful, though, with this, because you might have too many open at one time, and it can get frustrating and a bit overwhelming, and so that's why I do try to have most of them in a combined PNID set. Also, flattening PNIDs helps to consolidate informational layers in the drawing and may help make a smaller file that's easier to work with and navigate. Um, at the end of the day, with the remote PHA, you're constantly moving around different uh, windows, and so it just helps make things a bit faster, which is helpful. Um, so that's a key thing for a remote PHA. You want to make sure that you can jump immediately to uh, the equipment that you're looking at, either for the cause or the consequence. And then grouping causes is also important. And then predefined communication technical questions to support 
requires team preparedness. You want to make sure that your team is prepared, and at the end of the day, it is very helpful to tell them what information they need to be able to be adequately prepared. Um, so, for example, if you're going to need pump curves and PSD design basis information, sometimes it's helpful to provide a list up front of all the different pumps, and then just ask for pump curves, and that way that information is readily available at the time of EHA. Um, PSD design basis, as long as they have the ability to quickly locate that information. Same with pump curves, then it's not an issue. Sometimes it's um, not easily locatable as a result. So you never know, but if they know what information they're going to need, then they can become prepared. Okay, so now I'm going to go through implement, uh, implementation tips for the remote hands off group. So, implementation tips. Consideration to company security restrictions, for example, file sharing. Um, as a third-party facilitator, I experienced a file transfer inability and uh, some chat restrictions due to client company security firewalls. Therefore, I would recommend looking into company restrictions associated with the Telex Collaboration software package beforehand to be aware, and then you can find workarounds prior to session time. Uh, if file sharing restrictions or internet access or intranet access is an issue for non-affiliated devices, it might be beneficial to have a secondary computer available with this access. Um, it's been very helpful in my experience. Uh, also, help participants identify bandwidth sinks. So some impacts to connectivity issues could be due to other users in the home, security system, television, uh, internet, radio, gamers, just some things to think about if you're having bandwidth sinks or if you're having uh, connectivity issues. Also, determine when mute makes sense. Um, so periodically remind participants to use the mute feature to control occasional background noise or echoing feedback if multiple devices are present, but also remind them to unmute themselves if they wish to be heard. If the facilitator and scribe are using multiple computers at the same location, only one microphone should be active. That uh, helps eliminate the echoing and feedback concerns. Also, for long silences, waiting for a response. This happens often um, with a remote PHA. Remind the team if they're on mute. That's um, sometimes a concern. It helps. You want to, as, as a facilitator, to make sure that the team discussions are going smoothly. You want to be constantly reminding them. Mute is important, but also you need to uh, keep that and take that into consideration when you're going through team session time. Um, and then also PNID red lines during remote PHAs. So you want to ensure that all participants have a copy of the PNIDs in PDF or other suitable format. Uh, so I just did a, tank, a remote, uh, remote PHA for a tank farm, and so we had multiple incorrect lines, uh, which caused difficulties with following the flow paths and determining uh, consequences. And so also there were additional red lines of missing valves that caused confusion. So for these types of significant red lines, um, they should really be captured electronically on the shared PNID set during session time to ensure that all participants are on the same page and have the same information when evaluating the scenarios. Um, and then next, you want to avoid ghost participants. So verbally verify attendance at the beginning, after each break, and at the end of the day to ensure proper participation. Um, log attendance for remote meetings, obviously you won't have a sign-in sheet, so it's up to the facilitator and scribe to ensure that attendance is captured. Um, video usage pros and cons. So some organizations recommend the use of the video to ensure participation. However, this can present technical challenges, including creating distractions for the study and bandwidth issues. So pros and cons can vary and are often situationally based depending on various factors, including personal preference, remote space setup and surroundings, and company protocol. So there's just some things to take into consideration for that. Also, you want to direct questions to specific participants to facilitate a response. So you want to ensure also that individuals have paper and electronic copies of PNIDs and PSDs, depending upon their preference for the study. Okay, and with that, I'll welcome Steve back in, and he'll go through an example configuration of the remote PJ. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. All right. Um, 
Morgan, thank you very much. That worked out great. Uh, Morgan's actually going to uh, down the hallway to her office to get ready for a little demo in a few minutes. And uh, also Kayla will be joining in in a couple minutes too. Kayla's going to be going first. So uh, anyhow, what we want to do is just, again, try to provide some helpful tips here. Uh, the little photograph in the bottom right-hand side of your screen is actually our conference room where, where I'm at right now. Just so you know, if anybody was concerned, um, James, myself, and Morgan are all practicing physical distancing. If you're looking at the uh, photograph in your screen, uh, he's actually in the foreground, and I'm way in the back uh, by the backdrop that you probably recognize if you're looking at the video of me right now. Uh, this is something, we use this for broadcasting, for webinars, uh, we use this for, um, uh, rem it's one of our locations where we do remote PHAs. The way we've got this set up is kind of towards the middle of the room, we've got the scribe that has a laptop and uh, two external monitors attached. Uh, one, so he or she can see PNIDs, the primary screen, so they can uh, do worksheets using PHA Pro, PHA Works or whatever their relevant software is, and another cable that snakes around to one of the screens in the foreground, which is, is going to directly echo the, the PHA notes. Uh, that's so that the uh, facilitator can be right there at their station, which is in the foreground, looking at the notes, and also they've got their primary computer and a second screen where they can drive PNIDs or access other process safety information, and also that, that other third screen so that they can actually do uh, other communications or if they need to dig something up or make some other arrangements. Uh, we found this to be quite quite practical. It's a, set, a situa setup like this is really good for dual communication channels. So you can easily do PHA worksheets and uh, engineering drawings displayed, transfer presentation rights, etc. So again, lots of ways to skin the cat, but this is one setup that, that actually works, works out pretty well. Uh, you're well, hopefully, if it's helpful, great, feel free to do the same thing. Uh, also, the way we've got the room set up, uh, the scribe and facilitator are socially distant and meet all uh, appropriate CDC guidelines with respect to ventilation and distancing, etc. So th these things, whether it's not this, this specific setup, scribe and facilitator can also be in separate geographic locations. Uh, a lot of these, there's lots of ways to get to make this work with the tools that are available. Uh, and we just wanted to present one example. Next slide, please, James. All right, this is also something you can clip out and copy if you want to. When, when I start a remote PHA, usually people are kind of joining in, hopefully on time, a few, maybe a few minutes early, and we usually do like a little splash screen. In fact, I'll try to make it a little fancy and put up a um, picture of their refinery or whatever it is in, their, in the background of the slide. And so when they log in, they've got something to look at. They can go ahead and adjust their monitor. They can get comfortable with their remote location. And also what we try to do is even if we got dual communication channels going, get one going, make sure everybody's engaged and they can communicate, then get the second one going. That way people are confused. They get the wrong one going. They can't hear. They can't see. And it, and it gets, gets kind of messy trying to get things started. The whole idea of the remote PHA is to get things done efficiently, not hamstring yourself with communications challenges. Um, the, one, the single biggest problem, especially for folks who are new at this, is uh, not using mute properly, killing your, killing your uh, audio so it doesn't cause interference with somebody else if you're not talking and vice versa, um, making sure that you know um, that how your computer's set up. They can, they can use this to, to go ahead and get their computer set up properly. Uh, also, the important thing, this is another very common problem, is people who are new to this using having multiple devices, all with microphones and speakers, uh, you can easily get echoing or some really nasty feedback. Feedback as in uh, electronic feedback and some pretty uncomfortable noises. That can happen pretty easily. Um, this this kind of helps re remind them and maybe they can, they can adjust their workstation. Um, some, some people like to use the camera feed. It can be useful, but it can be a bandwidth hog. So uh, use video if it's necessary. If you're having bandwidth problems, start cutting things out. Also, I usually um, uh, remind people that there's a lot of things going on in people's homes nowadays. They, they may have kids at home. They may have teenagers that are, that are gaming. They may have TVs going. They, their own security system. Sometimes, sometimes they've got cameras that are transmitting 100% of the time. 
all these things eat bandwidth. So it's really easy to, to, for people to uh, run into some communication challenges, especially out of the home. So they need to, to be thinking about what do they need to kill or turn off if they, if they got some problems. And I usually put my phone number in case there are communications problems. If I'm facilitating, if somebody's having troubles and can't hear me, I want to know about it right away because that impacts PHA quality. So it's, it's a stop until you get it resolved uh, if, if the communications are important with that individual. And you just stop the PHA, get them squared away, and move on. That's another reason why you want a splash screen or somebody to something so they can get logged in early and get their whatever issues they've got worked out. So yeah, feel free to clip this out as reminders and, and do whatever you want with it. Hopefully it's helpful. Um, next slide, please, James. Okay, so you've heard enough from me. What I want to do is uh, transfer. Do we want to do some demonstrations? So what we're going to do is first transfer over to Kayla Cervera, who's at a uh, remote location. She'll transfer back to Morgan, who's down the hall. Morgan, both will do demonstrations. Um, uh, they'll explain what they're doing, and then they'll transfer back to me for some closure. And I'm going to go ahead and invite Morgan back for socially distant Q&A session. All right, thank you guys, and let's turn it over to Kayla. For remote. Hi everyone, um, I'm going to be giving a short demo on Microsoft Teams and its functionality um, in regards to performing a remote PHA. Um, this software is very simple to navigate and I personally found it very efficient for remote collaborative work. So first, I'd like to start off with the Teams function. So prior to your PHA, it's very helpful to create your team. This will help keep all key players in the same place and also improve data transfer and information capability. So to access this, you're gonna click the Teams tab on your Microsoft Teams dashboard. In here, you'll have your already created Teams or ones that you're a part of. And below at the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to join or create a team. So I've already creating, created a team for this demo, which I will be navigating through to show some examples. So once you've created your team, you will have generated a page that looks like this. And anything that is uploaded or stored here will be visible to all your team members, including any chats that you have amongst yourselves. And for example, if I go over to this files tabs on my team's page, I actually already uploaded a set of PNIDs and the whole team now has access to this. What this really does is minimizes the time in sharing files versus emailing documents throughout your entire team during session. And also we have this wiki tab that's, that's located on your team's page. And this is actually something I utilized in my most recent PHA. And this is where we identified pending tasks for team members that weren't able to be resolved at that particular point in time. And this ended up being a huge time saver, especially given how fast paced our PHA was. And for even more organization, you're actually able to tag responsible team members to tag. And this will provide them a notification of assignment through Teams. So by doing to do so, you go ahead and click the app sign. And you're actually going to have your suggested people or all the team members that are included on your team's page. This was extremely helpful in getting these parking lot items handle quickly. So now for creating your meeting. So you can create your meeting by clicking on the new meeting button in the calendar tab. So I've already set one up for the demo. So I'm gonna be using this to give my example. So here, there's a multitude of helpful information you could add to the meeting invite. One that is particularly useful is this optional attendees feature. This will allow team members to know that they aren't necessarily required to attend the PHA, but their attendance may be helpful and needed at times. Otherwise, there's the name of the meeting, required attendees, the dates and times, whether this is a reoccurring event, which it usually is, because PHA typically lasts more than a day. These are all vital, this is all vital information for a meeting invite. Another feature that I found really helpful is you're actually able to attach your meeting invite to your team's page slash channel. And this provides ease for the team members as they're able to navigate them to the meeting as it will appear on the team's page as such. 
So now I will enter my meeting and I'll show you the logistics of how a meeting looks like on Microsoft Teams. So now that I've entered, I want to point out this more active task. So this shows some of the additional features Microsoft Teams has to offer, as Steve mentioned in the presentation. This includes the live options capa live captions capabilities, as well as the opportunity to start re screen recording your meeting. And that way you can use that for future reference. But the most important feature is definitely the share screen option. So this is found in the icon adjacent. So here, you'll be able to either share your main monitor, or in my case, I have two screens I'm currently using, and I'll be able to switch in between both monitors. This is the most important tool in directing your team's attention to the current scenario. So if I go to my screen one, this is where I'm actually performing and recording the PHA and PHA work. So this is the one I'm primarily using to direct the team through scenarios in the HAZOP or the LOPA. Um, but let's say, for example, my team doesn't exactly know what inline block valve I'm referring to. There might be a lot on that particular page that are untapped. So if I return to my team meeting, I end my share, I share again. On my screen two, you see that I have my PNIDs uploaded here and ready to go. So this will be helpful when you don't have the dual communication channels that Steve mentioned. It's not as effective, but it definitely will work for a PHA session. Lastly, I'd like to point out the ability to invite people into your meeting. So this finds itself useful for accommodation of situations where you need particularly answers, particular answers from different personnel that aren't including included in the meeting currently, and you need to answer those questions that the team is unsure of. And this is a very common occurrence that you may run into during CHA. So that is the end of my demo. I hope this is helpful when utilizing Microsoft Teams for future remote PHAs. Now I will hand it off to Morgan McVeigh for a redlining demo. Okay, thank you very much, Kayla, for that. We appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go through two different demos today. The first one is going to be how to make red lines on a PDF. Um, and then the second one is going to be how to use the whiteboard feature freehand by Envision in Microsoft Teams. So I'll start off with the first one. Here's an example um, PNID. And so if you're going through the PHA and you identify um, for example, that for these PSDs, these inline block valves need to be locked open and you want to make a red line. Um, so you've got your home tools and document. And so I'll go to tools and then you can go to comment. And that allows you to have all these toolboxes up here that will allow you to make some of the changes. Um, and so if you click text box, you can add a text box, add in locked open, for example. Um, and then if you right click it, go to properties, you'll have another window pop up. Uh, and on here, you can go to a clouded and which clouds it, which is a nice function. Um, so I'll push OK. You can also kind of change these, make it bigger, smaller, whatever you'd like. So I'm going to copy and paste that because there's another um, PSD with a block valve that should probably be locked open as well. Um, obviously, this is assuming that it's already on the locked valve list before you just redline the PNIDs. Otherwise, it should be a recommendation. You need to add it and, and so on. Um, anyways, so for red lines, then, for example, um, as I was mentioning before, blinds are kind of uh, helpful to be able to show the correct flow paths. So let's say, for example, this is actually blinded. Um, so when you're going through session time to make sure that you're analyzing it correctly, uh, it might be helpful to kind of depict a blind real quick. So um, I went into the dots here and then you can pick the oval. So I made a quick circle. I'm going to copy and paste it. So I've got to drag it over this one. I'm going to show I'm going to go to properties again, kind of like I showed before. Another window will come up. So this time I want it a closed blind. So I'm going to add in the fill color of red. So there we go. Move this one over a little bit. 
Um, and then also you can add in a line. And so there we go. And it doesn't have to be perfect when you're going through. You just want to make sure that it's enough information where the um, team can analyze that everybody's on the same page at the end of the day. Um, so there we go. We were able to add in a quick little blind. Um, another issue was if there were valves that weren't totally shown. Um, that can get confusing when you're analyzing it in imaginary valves. So let's say, for example, there's a level uh, transmitter on here. Well, there is a level transmitter, but a level control valve. So if it's missing a valve, you can go through and we can add it real quickly. And this can be done during session time. It shouldn't take too long. If you go to the connected lines, um, then you can just kind of add the valve really quickly. There you go. And then you have to right click and do complete. I'm going to do that again real quick just to show the rest of the valve. complete and then back to our text box like I showed before and you can add in LV1 for example um, and then I'm going to draw in another line I'm going to do the connected one so here's our level transmitter and so we'll show this going here and connecting and then I'll complete it just like before right click properties same window will come up again and this time I'm going to go to the style of the line and show it's an electrical signal so I'm going to put a dashed line so there we go we've got a dashed line that's going to a level control valve and then um, you can also add in the cloud if you'd like just to show that this is a red line and should be captured and again this is for PHA remote PHA use to make sure that the team is on the same page so this is just a quick way of going through and adding some things so you're all analyzing um, and uh, analyzing the same scenarios. Okay, so that shows my red line. I'm gonna uh, go to, so this is Microsoft Teams. This is the second demo. So this is Freehand by Envision. And I wanted to kind of give an overview um, of the potential usefulness of the whiteboard feature within Teams. So Kayla went through and showed you how to uh, go through Teams and start a conversation and uh, some of the other features. And so this is just one of the many options that Teams has to offer, it's the whiteboard function. Um, and so overall, this is, I wanted to give you an, an immediate uh, visual representation of what could be done with this. So for example, you can bring in uh, the PNID. I just took a quick snip and then uploaded it. And then with that, you can, during session time, it's helpful because you can have an immediate visual representation of upstream equipment for scenario analysis. So sometimes there's 10 PNIDs in between. Um, so this is a storage tank. And so this could come, for example, upstream could be a tower and the normal flow path could be to another tower, but there could be a pressure controller. Um, and that pressure controller will open up this valve, which sends it uh, sends flow to the downstream tank. And so uh, having a visual representation is really helpful, uh, and that way you don't have to back up 10 PNIDs, or after your operator or your engineer does back up those PNIDs, then it's helpful uh, to have a visual representation. And then you can also do the same thing on the downstream side. So this is an overview. I can now go through and show you how to uh, make something like this really quickly. Um, so let's go back to our PNID. We can, I'm going to go to the snip, snipping tool function really quickly. And so right here I took a, a um, snip. And so I'm going to right click and click copy. I'm going to get out of that. And then here I can do control V and paste it. So as you see, it's pretty easy to get this information on the whiteboard, which I appreciate. Um, and so then you've got your tools here. So this uh, is your pointer. Uh, this is your pencil. And so you can click different um, options here. You can change the color up here. Uh, I'll keep it with uh, pink for now. And then you also have a text option that allows you to write. And then if you go to the dots, you can uh, add a shape and then image. I just copied and pasted it in directly, but you can also show the image, which is helpful. Um, okay, so let's get started. We'll start with a shape. So for example, we can show that upstream tower 
Um, and then I know we had also a downstream tower, which was helpful. And then we can click our pencil tool and we can show the normal flow path goes through here. Um, and then we can also show that there's another line that connects into here. And this is, again, it's just a visual representation to help us. And so I'll zoom in a bit. I'm gonna put in the text button. And so I can add in, let's say this is tower one. And then over here, we can add text. We click the text again and then do tower two. And then I'll pick, pick the pencil and I'm gonna draw in the pressure transmitter that I was talking about before. Connect that in, and then also can draw in the valve. Connect the two. And so as you can see, this is just a really quick visual representation that you can add in during session time, and it helps the team um, be on the same page. You can even add in um, set points if that's helpful. Okay. Um, yep, so that's a quick uh, visual representation of how quickly you can uh, present this. And it's again using freehand by Envision. So, with that, I'm going to uh, transfer it back to James and we'll continue with QA. Oh, am I back? Okay. Uh, okay, good. Uh, am I live? Okay, good. All right. Um, Morgan, thank you. And uh, welcome back, everybody. Next slide, please. So everybody's anxious to get on with the webinar and on with their jobs. I'd like to briefly summarize. Next. Uh, we'll keep this simple so we can actually the other way. There you go. All right. Um, we'll keep this simple so we can get on to the question and answer period. Just, just keep in mind, remote PHAs can be very efficient, but it does require some extra planning and preparation. The things that we discussed, equipment checks, software checks, pre-causing, all those things are going to be helpful for you to be successful in running your remote PHA. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages. Everything's unique. It depends on your situation, depends on the team. But uh, there are lots of good applications for remote PHAs, pandemic or no pandemic. And right now, there's a lot of essential reasons for keeping the team healthy and not especially not traveling that are very, very helpful for the application of remote PHAs. The technology is there. The experience is there. You will, if, as long as you prepare properly, you should be very successful and impressive to people. You can accelerate the projects, progress of efforts such as capital projects. Even under normal conditions, you can uh, help control projects by keeping things moving forward when you apply remote collaboration techniques. You can enhance teamwork, getting people to work together, and right now, provide a safe environment for team members. You can keep them from traveling and also enable them to work, whereas otherwise they might not be able to. All rolled together, this can result in remote PHAs, whether you're pan uh, pandemic or not pandemic conditions, can result in tangible savings to the owner operator. Next, please. All right. Where things are going, gosh, so much has changed just in the past decade. Uh, we're continuing to make technological advances that make this even easier and easier. How things will end up, gosh, just a couple of decades ago, we were doing this on pencil and paper, then computers, now telecollaboration. Uh, whatever's happening, I would encourage all process safety professionals, keep on top of, of the game with respect to the, these developments in information sharing technologies. It's part of your job, number one, and you'll be able to provide more value into the effort that you're doing. And it's kind of our responsibility to make the most of people's times and to make sure that, that the, we're maximizing the level of safety of plant sites. Next. So anyhow, I want to thank everybody for their, their attendance, all the people on this end who made it happen, even while we're social distancing. And uh, I hope this provided you with some helpful techniques, the ability to get the job done, and you know, if you're in charge of PHAs, whether at the plant site, getting external PHA facilitators, or even the facilitator and scribe team, you've got an awesome responsibility. It's a, the job that you're doing is super important for protecting personnel, the environment, and also the, the public outside the plant site boundaries. Uh, this is an awesome responsibility. Hopefully we're providing some tools to make it easier. 
Um, maybe a little different from the way you've normally done things, but tele telecollaboration is practical. Remote PHAs are a good application. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, Morgan and I are going to go off camera so we can socially distance on our end, and we'll go ahead and answer questions that come up. Anyhow, thank you again for your, your participation. All right, so our first question, and if you have any further questions, you can still answer them at this point. Our first question is regarding remote software. What about Google Hangout? Has RMP Corp evaluated Google Hangouts? Uh, this is Steve. I have not done that personally. Morgan? Um, I've used it in more of an academic setting, but not for PHAs in particular yet. Okay. Do you think, can it be adapted for this, do you think? Um, yeah, there's definitely there's so many different softwares and different mechanisms out there to use. Um, and Google Hangout is another screen sharing application with um, other functions as well, so I don't see why not. Yeah, I haven't seen that in the business environment very much. So realistically, the um, I think what you want to do if you're setting up a PHA is make sure that you're using tools that are compatible with how people are doing work on your team. Every team's different, but if they're very accustomed to using software product X, chances are it makes a lot more sense to morph into that and be compatible with what the team is doing. So that's the first step is to find out what the undercurrent of activities is, what people are used to using, what they're accustomed to doing and set up for, and, to, and try to morph into that. Obviously, as Morgan said, there's lots of tools that can be used. So our next question is with regards to your presentation, Morgan. How do you get to Whiteboard? Um, so Whiteboard is an added tab that you have to go through and add that specific tab to the group. So at the bottom of the screen, um, there's an Applications button. Should I go back here? Uh, why, why don't we do this? If, if you think it'd be helpful, Morgan, uh, maybe after the QA period, we'll do that one last. Okay. It's very specific to the one individual. Yeah. And also, you can get back to your, your office and go ahead and fire it up again if you want to and help that person out. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Overall, though, there is an application button on the bottom where you can search for the application whiteboard. Um, and then all you have to do is click that. And then you install it, and you have to it, you just bring it into the team, the specific team that you already have set up. Kayla showed you how to set up the team, so that should be um, pretty self-explanatory. But at the end, I can go through and, and show that as well. So pausing this question for further demonstration, the next question is: How easy is it to operate with the scribe and facilitator in remote locations? That, that's a great question. Um, if you had asked me that question a couple months ago. I would have said I strongly recommend that they be in the same geographic location, but it really depends on the people. I, right now, um, as Morgan mentioned, a lot of the uh, scribes we use are younger engineers who can really not only benefit from the experience from an engineering perspective, uh, but also they can go ahead and, and add their two cents into the, the discussion and, and absorb more from the, from the, the conversations that are going on. Uh, the key word there was, was young. There's a lot of folks that are, are a little bit, it's a little bit more intuitive to use these remote tools. And we've had, uh, surprising to me at least, uh, high levels of success, perhaps even 100% for people being in, for the scribe and facilitator being in different locations. Morgan, do you want to chime in? Yeah, um, so at the end of the day, I think it really depends upon the scribe and facilitator dynamics. Um, obviously, if it's somebody that you've worked with before, then you guys, then oftentimes at the end of the day, they are already on the same page and they know, and you already know how to work together. So it's pretty easy to do from a distance. Also, if you have a scribe that's really able to follow along and uh, is also has an engineering background and is able to capture kind of what the team is saying, then that allows them to kind of automatically translate that and to write that into the documentation without even the facilitator needing to direct the scribe and what to type. And the facilitator instead can be focusing on the team discussion and asking the right questions and getting the information that the scribe needs to uh, that the scribe needs to then write it down and capture it. Um, so it really depends on your scribe facilitator uh, relationship and uh, experience at the end of the day. But yeah, absolutely, if you've got a good scribe that knows what's going on and able to follow the PHA, then absolutely going uh, doing a PHA in remote locations with the scribe and facilitator would not be an issue. Our next question is, 
Is it important for the facilitator to have full access to all PSI? That completely depends. <laughs> Um, that depends upon the access that, well, and involvement of the process engineer. If the process engineer is able to quickly um, and easily capture mo uh, the, the PSI information that's needed during the study, um, then, I, then it is more beneficial for them to take on that role and to make sure that they uh, are following along and gathering that information that the, facilitate, that the team needs to correctly analyze the scenario. Um, the facilitator is all already going through and capturing a lot. They can help out with some of the information and help to identify some of the information um, with respect to PSI. However, at the end of the day, really, it, it, you need the engineer to go through and sift through and analyze the information correctly. And so having them look it up keeps them involved and, um, and also ensures that the correct PSI information is being used. Uh, that's spot on. I'll echo the same thing. Uh, the, if you look at the textbooks and classic way of doing a HAZOP study, the facilitator's got a job to do, the process engineer's got a job to do, and in this particular case for remote PHAs, um, just as a facilitator classically for in-person PHAs has to have certain skill sets and is very bu busy multitasking during the PHA to keep that team going, uh, there may be a few additional responsibilities that they've got that they have to multitask on during the PHA. So making sure that the process engineer does their job in terms of PSI access and, and providing that knowledge base to the team, it's even more important for a remote PHA, and you don't want to burden the facilitator with that because they've got a job to do. Also, I do, I do want to add in, um, it, it, depending upon your company and how you handle uh, consequences that could be in different units. Uh, uh, looking up all, uh, other PHAs to ensure that specific scenarios and hazards are, cap are captured, um, that might be helpful for the facilitator to have access to those other PHAs so they can ensure that by closing this valve, hazards were discussed and analyzed accordingly within another PHA. Um, I know facilitators obviously have more use using PHA Pro software, and kind of know how things are organized and can oftentimes find those scenarios a little bit easier than maybe, say, the uh, process engineer. And so having access to related uh, interconnected unit PHAs would be helpful for the facilitator, um, in my opinion. So our next question is, is continual participation by the control system specialist during the entire PHA necessary? Um, absolutely. Now, now the reality is, is um, in the distant past when, when uh, control and protection systems were a lot simpler and they, they didn't involve the distributed control systems that we have today, and, and also the separate safety instrument systems and all those things that come together in the control room, uh, in the distant past, maybe it was understandable and decipherable from the PHA, from the PNIDs, how everything worked. Uh, things have become a lot more complex. And in fact, a lot of the control systems use uh, multiple variables for process parameters throughout the plant, throughout the unit, and, and uh, combine all those in, into their control scheme. Uh, this is not evident from the PNID, and having a control and protection systems uh, specialist on the team is super important. Now, practically, in the past, you didn't necessarily need that, uh, but it's become more and more important over the years. But pragmatically, these folks are also very busy. So sometimes it's hard to, if, for us as third-party facilitators to get the support continually that we need. So, but it's still super important that they get dragged in uh, using this ability for remote collaboration as necessary to answer these questions because the systems have become more complicated. So the short answer is yes, it's necessary. Practically, you're gonna have problems because these folks are kind of scarce and very busy but the use of these remote collaboration techniques does make it easier and enhances their ability to participate. And the facilitator has to make a judgment, just like any other technical specialist on the team, are they getting the support they need? And if not, pull the plug. If you, uh, everybody on a PHA has stop work authority if it's not going properly, the facilitator needs to exercise that if they're not getting the technical support they need.
at, at the end of the day, when you look at the PHA Pro software, you've got three main columns. You've got your cause, your initiating cause, you've got your consequence where everything goes wrong, and then you've got your safeguards. Your safeguards are all those controls, trips, and you need the set points and everything associated with that. So really having a controls engineer available to get that information, that's a third of the PHA. And it's really hard to continue with an evaluation of likelihood when you don't know what specific controls and trips and, and set points and stuff are what exists. Um, so it is very critical to have that information. Um, again, with resources, if it's not feasible to have a controls uh, engineer there the entire time, then as long as they can uh, be called in remotely via Teams or whatever software is being used, and that they're easily accessible to get immediate information, um, then then that would be manageable. But but really, the controls and safeguards are a third of the PHA, so it is very helpful to have them present. Our next question is, we are having trouble with remote PHA efficiency with team members becoming distracted. Is there a solution to this? I'll go ahead and help. I'll, I'll get started. I'm sure you got a few things to identify here. This is Steve again. Um, this is this is a common potential problem. Uh, people at remote locations, you're not right there, so they, they may get distracted. Other things may come up. It's actually become worse in general, even for in-person PHAs over the years. Uh, people bring in their laptops. Their bosses may ask questions. Other issues may come up, and they can get distracted. So these things are, have become a problem over the past years and are enhanced with remote PHAs. Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the facilitator has always had a lot of things to do as multitasking, a lot of responsibilities, and they're very busy trying to chart the course of the team, where the team is going, engage them technically for, for what's, what's being discussed, and also work with the scribe about what was just discussed. So there's a lot of things the facilitator has to do. Unfortunately, this is this is one of them. They have additional responsibilities for remote PHAs because they have to ensure that everybody's engaged but people are distant. Some things you can do is make sure that you call out people's names periodically and get them to engage. Ask specific questions with names, not just general questions. And uh, if, if somebody, uh, if you ask uh, for Joe, and Joe doesn't know, then somebody else is going to chime in if they really have the information, but it'll keep Joe engaged. And if you do that frequently, everybody knows that their name's going to get called. It's kind of like uh, having a classroom where the teacher calls on a specific individual. If they know they're going to get called, they're more likely to pay attention. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, I've heard frequent breaks are, are very helpful. Uh, you got to use some judgment as a facilitator. Some teams need more frequent breaks than others. Uh, some teams almost need a briefing on what a HAZOP study is every 90 minutes. So as a facilitator, every team, every situation is differently. You've got to gauge what's necessary to keep your team, uh, team involved and take action accordingly. And I've had cases where I've run teams, if you're on deadline for startup or whatever, uh, 12 or 14 hours. There's nothing wrong with that, but as a facilitator, you've got to verify and, and be able to, to gauge whether the team is properly engaged. And so these are part of the responsibilities of the facilitator. Yeah, I'll echo um, what Steve said. Um, so PHAs are really a team effort. Um, as you're going through, you're asking questions specifically to specific individuals, and it's, it's a team effort with everyone. Really has to be involved to come to any sort of conclusion. It's not, it's not like a lecture where somebody can really get distracted and walk away. There are constantly questions being fired to the engineer, the operator, what's the normal operating temperature here, what equipment does this go to, and they're constantly interacting and responding to that. So there really isn't that much opportunity, in my opinion, at least with the engineer and operator, to get too distracted. And then if you do have other uh, team members present, such as controls or MI, or as long as you direct specific questions to them and start off with their name, um, that'll get their attention immediately and they know that the question is directed to them and uh, it makes it hard to get too distracted when everybody's waiting on you. And I'll just add to that too. Keep in mind that this is a new slant to the game uh, of how to do PHAs. Uh, just, as, just as facilitators need to have special skills and describe special skills under normal situations, uh, the game, the, uh, there's additional responsibilities here. 
the, the understanding of communication technologies, how software packages work, um, being able to engage your team remotely. These, there are additional challenges here for the scribe and the facilitator, and it is more challenging. And, and doing a remote PHA, all the tools are there, it can work very well, but it can also fall flat on its face. If you've got the, if the person's not properly prepared, if they're not willing to take on the challenges, and also we're all different. Not everybody's geared for this. So uh, keep that in mind whenever you're setting up or scheduling a remote PHA, that there's some new skill sets that are even more important for these remote PHA and remote collaboration activities in general. And make sure your, your facilitator scribe team especially, and the entire team is able to accommodate that. All right, so we have no further questions posted as of now. Please feel free to add any additional questions you have. At this time, we'll switch the presentation rights back to Morgan so that she can reiterate the answer and demonstrate how to gain access to Whiteboard. Okay, thank you, James. Um, so I believe the question had to be with how to get to freehand by Envision. And so I'll go back to Teams. And so for my whiteboard demo here. Um, so you can go through, and then this is kind of what I was showing before. And then right here is your present button. So then now you're able to present it. Let me find, yeah, so right here, right here is where you can do your video. Um, so we can meet now. Um, gonna turn that off and turn mute off. And then so right here when you share your screen, this is how you get your whiteboard options. So when you're sharing it, you can see you normally share it here and your whiteboard options are here. So white, Microsoft Whiteboard is also useful. It doesn't have all the tools um, that are in freehand by Envision, which is why I preferred this one. Um, but if you just click that, now I'm sharing my screen with everyone and they can see what I'm working on and I can continue. Um, so present mode, and then I can continue working with these things and adding in um, more. I can grab the pencil, add in another valve here, and continue. And then they can watch as I'm going through and add on it even, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. To get it in, um, in the first place, the apps is down here. I'll uh, end that call. Um, what was that, the whiteboard? So you can go to the whiteboard right here, freehand by Envision and the apps, and then you can click it and then you just add it to a team. Um, and then it, it shows up. So you gotta search the team. So I think I called this one um, the whiteboard demo. So it comes up, set up tab, and then uh, you do have to log in. Um, and then it will save it. I already have it here, so it's not letting me do it again. Um, or I can add another one as well. But yeah, so uh, hopefully that was helpful. I will send, I uh, give the rights back to James now. There aren't gonna be any floating out. <laughs> oh, okay, am I live? Okay, yeah. just a final thank you for attending. Uh, if you do have any other further questions, you've got, in fact, right on the screen, uh, email addresses and phone numbers that you can go ahead and track us down. Uh, again, the work that we're all doing as far as PHAs is super important. Uh, if you have questions or want to bounce some ideas off of us, give us a call. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye.